We, oh, okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm David Newsno. Gravity, for those of you who don't know me, which is probably most of you looking at the room. Um, so this is a boff that was supposed to be much smaller originally. I can't believe the number of people who are actually really interested in this. I thought it was going to be like 10 people and everyone, was, everyone else can be like, oh, I love Subversion because Git sucks and it's impossible to use. Uh, apparently, that's changed over the past few months, though, with 1.5 release especially. So I... I I'm not entirely sure what the makeup of the audience is and how to structure this talk entirely, or boff. Um, so what, how many people are using Git right now and consider themselves fairly good with it, fairly workable? And how many people have no experience at all with Git? And really, oh wow, okay. So that's a pretty large number. So I'm not going to try and sell you on Git per se, especially not against well, I will try and tell you on it versus something like Subversion, because frankly, it's a much better model. I won't try and compare it to things like Bizzer or TLA, because um, I don't want to talk about TLA, or Mercurial, because those are fine systems in their own rights, and they're all distributed too, and most of this will apply to the distributed stuff as well. Um, but really what this is important, what's important about Git is that it's being used by core components of any Linux distribution now. Between x.org, thanks to the man in the yellow shirt there, and um, the Linux kernel, we have really major pieces of our infrastructure using this revision control system. And it's worth learning just for that. And I think it really does scale all the way up and it scales all the way down to your private projects. You can maintain your one text file with Git without any troubles. It's really quite easy. Um, so, just by way of introduction, so uh, the x Strike Force switched to Git a few months ago when git.demi.org was, was established, um, thanks to um, Buxy and the Alioth team for, for putting that together, and we were able to put that in. And we really wanted to do this because x.org had switched to Git um, from CVS. And being a distributed vision control system, all of a sudden we had this major advantage of switching to it. Previously, we were using Subversion, which was maintained um, not on a Debian server, it was maintained by Brennan Robinson, who I'm sure most people probably know, having been famous in formal GPL. Um, and we were using Subversion. We were happy with it. It worked. It was slow as can be. Um, it was hosted on a DSL line, and for pretty much anything, if you wanted to, you know, um, you know, get the status and all this stuff, you, you really had to, you had to hit the network for a lot of things, and it was really slow. And you don't realize how slow it is until you're not having to hit the network every single time you have to do it, an operation. Um, but we switched to Git with the help of a team member who unfortunately couldn't be here, Theory Redding, who um, is actually our Compies maintainer as well. And he wrote a massive infrastructure to um, convert our really horrible subversion repository, which was thanks to me and being sloppy, um, into Git, and we've maintained pretty much all the history that we had before. And you can do this if you have subversion, you can do this if you have CVS. Um, there are tools that come with Git to do that. I'm not going to demonstrate them, but they're available. Um, so because we had an upstream that we were working from, we really wanted to do things slightly differently than was standard. With subversion, what you can do, what's, I don't know if everyone does this, I think a lot of people do. Um, well, probably not in Debian, actually, because SVM build package doesn't do this. But um, with Subversion, one thing you can do is have a vendor branch. And you can check in into your vendor branch um, the upstream code, copy it over to your working master branch, your trunk, and then do all your work there, have all your Debian packaging in there in the trunk. Um, so we wanted something sort of similar to this in theory. We wanted a separate upstream branch that we would have that you could easily diff against, say, upstream's branch. And you could also easily diff against your working branch to see what's changed, if anything. So we actually have that. So what I've got here is just a fresh checkout of our ATI driver, just because it's convenient, um, that we keep in our, in, on git.debian.org. Um, so what you see is when you clone, when you clone a Git repository, initially, in, with 1.5, you only get one branch checkout. In this case, it's telling you, you set up to whatever it is. By default, it's master. We've set it up to be the Debian unstable branch. And what you can see here is that we have several branches that go from origin. Origin is a remote, in, in this case, it's git.debian.org. You can call it whatever you want. It's basically an alias. Um, and we, we have git.debian.org as our origin. And what we've got is, the way we've set things up is we've got these dash experimental or unstable branches. And we both have upstream and Debian versions. Um, the upstream version is literally just a clone from um, the, the git.freedesktop.org repositories. 
And the way we do this is we just pull it straight in, and it's very easy, you just do git pull, and it goes straight in. And then what we do is we pull it in further into our Debian branch. And if we want to make custom changes to the Debian packaging, for example, or outside the Debian packaging in the sources, but we don't want to push them upstream, uh, we can keep them in that branch, we keep them separate. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that upstream can look directly at the upstream dash unstable. If there's a bug report that's filed in the, the freedesktop.org bugzilla, I don't know if anyone's actually doing this in free desktop, but we provide this ability, um, you can easily diff it against head, uh, the, the x.org master head, and just say, oh, well, there's a fix that was checked in that you don't have yet because you're running unstable, but look, in your experimental version, it's there. So this makes it trivial to do this, actually, if you want to do this. Upstream might not be doing it, but I, I, I try and use it on occasion, and it is nice to have this sort of flexibility. Um, and Quite frankly, with Subversion, you can't get this because it's not really distributed. Um, so that's basically how we do things. We also, we've been keeping our patches in, we keep our long-term patches in, in using a patch system called Quilt. How many people are using Quilt? By just out of curiosity. How many people are using Dpatch or, okay, all of you using Dpatch have already lost. You've, you've really made the wrong choice. Um, Quilt is so much better, I can't even tell you. Um, pretty much. Git has various add-ons that you can use, Quilt-like versions it, it integrated, things like stgit or um, gilt, and then there's another one that I, I don't know. I haven't evaluated these personally. I've heard very good things about them. They don't um, interact properly with Git web, so you can't, if you're browsing a repository with, with the web, you can't um, see what's different. So that's, that's kind of an issue and why we keep things in, in Quilt still. So for long-running things, you can keep the stuff in Git if you want to. We haven't made that transition mainly because we haven't, um, we haven't evaluated it. Are you, Pierre, you're, you're a Git maven. Are you using any of these stat, patch stack things? Not yet. Is anyone using them? ST Git or anything? What's that? Uh, actually, I've patched Quilt uh, a lot uh, so that uh, it uh, supports POSIX shells. Uh, it, there is a branch upstream uh, with my uh, patches in it. And it seems Quilt, Quilt uh, is really uh, lighter than, uh, than STGIT uh, that mm. uses the Python uh, a lot and it's quite slow. Okay. Okay. We found this, this whole method works really well. So, okay. If, if you want to do things and you want to maintain packages with Git, I really, I think that using Quilt is a really good way to go for long, if you have long running patches that you need to keep out of, you know, we've got things that really should not be push text or org upstream and um, that's how we keep them out. So if anyone wants to talk about how to use Quilt, I can do that privately if you'd like. Um, but, it, you know, I'd like to focus on Git for a little while if possible. Um, so, I don't know, I, I'd like to open up for questions actually, because I mean, I can do a whole tutorial thing but in reality, I don't think I'm going to be any better than a, uh, the documentation that's out there. So if, is there any questions about the X strike force and how we use Git or anyone, if you've got general questions about Git and why you would use it and why, Ian. So, uh, if you could just sort of, um, Maybe the intersection between Debian um, approach and Git, because there's, there's quite a lot of good Git documentation, a lot of good Debian documentation, but the intersection is a bit vague. Right. So Git actually works really well for the Debian model of doing things, um, just because in terms, Ian asked about the intersection between Debian and, and Git and documenting using this stuff. Um, so Git actually works very well for the Debian model of doing things because by nature we're all very distributed. Um, it's really nice to have the ability to just pull out um, the repository and work on it even if it's not your own repository. Uh, and it becomes your repository in a sense. And I mean, um, where it doesn't seem to work well is the, the Linux kernel model of using Git. There's two real ways to use Git, and I haven't seen anyone besides the Linux kernel using this model, where there's no central repository. People kind of accept Linus's tree as the central tree, but in reality there isn't one. The way you do things is pull only. Um, Mercurial was actually written to use pull only. That was the model they had in mind as well. And the idea is that just you pull things into your tree, and if people, if you're Linus Torvalds, you pull in who you want, and then everyone gets your tree because they're interested in your tree. It's not like Linus's tree is the god tree. Um, but I think everyone else that I've talked to is using this sort of centralized subversion-like model. We certainly do for the X Strike Force, where we've got 
basically one XORG tree, that we, XORG server tree that we use, for example, and it's really the canonical tree. We can have user trees if we want, we can have user branches, but in reality there's the one tree that we consider the right one. And the reason for that is simply we don't have a thousand contributors like the kernel. You know, we've got, you know, me, me and Julian hacking on it. So, <laughs> um, it's, it's not a massive thing. And Git can scale up in that way, but a lot of the docs are made for that sort of model, Git format patch and all this stuff, which isn't really as useful for, um, for the Debian model. Um, so, I'm not entirely sure what other sort of intersection things you might be curious about. Yeah. Hi, I'm Junichi Eko, and I maintain Dpatch using Git, but <laughs> um, there are... <laughs> Uh, there are other tools in Debian, like Git build package mm -hmm. and like dev scripts, dev commit tools. Do you use those tools? Okay, so I've, I've experimented with both. So Git build package, has anyone used Git build package but me? <laughs> One per, two people, okay. So Git build package is really not built for the specific problems that the X-Strike Force faces. If your upstream is using Git, um, using Git build package will do the wrong thing every time. It expects you to have a dot .orig, dot tar, dot .gz that you have to import. It expects that every time. So if you don't have that, you know, we do have that, but we like to pull directly from free desktop. It makes sense. So, you know, we like to, we like to cherry pick individual package, patches straight in, and then when we merge, they get merged in magically. You know, Git does, Git does all the work. Um, so Git pill package will work, and it does work for people. It's a little finicky to use with pbuilder and stuff, which uh, you might be aware of, or at least it was a few months ago when I was actively trying to get it to work for us. Um, but for if your upstream is using Git, I don't recommend Git build package. If they are using it, I think it's a great tool. As for uh, deb commit, I think was the other one you mentioned. So I was using that as well. And the problem with deb commit, so do people actually, do, does anyone use deb commit perhaps with subversion? It's a great tool. So deb commit, okay, so only not everyone's familiar with it. Deb commit will, when you, when you, make a change to your Debian change log, you run deb commit, it will pull out the change, it will take the diff from your Debian change log and use that as your commit message for, for committing. It's actually very nice for subversion. Um, for Git though, the way Git formats its log messages, so you've got, for example, this, this one line, merge, I, I've merged France, but here, um, move the files so it'll be put into Debian XFPS, so you don't have to worry about what this means, but basically there's one summary line. And then what happens is that there's several other lines below it potentially if you want to have a very long log file. Um, you know, if you've got a lot you want to explain. So what happens with deb commit is that it'll use the whole thing as one long thing. So you'll have this one long master um, line when this is really supposed to be much shorter. Um, so that's a problem with using deb commit with Git. And the other issue is that, okay, so a lot of people probably don't know Git. So Git, um, exposes something called the index. Um, and this is really a sore point for a lot of people. It's really something you kind of have to wrap your brain around. Um, and it's really not that complicated. Basically, you can think of it as a staging area. And everything has this. So Subversion has a, an index. And it's basically, when you run Subversion diff, um, it, it compares the index, which is, you know, it's cached version of what all the files, versus, you know, what your changed file is, and it gives you the diff. It doesn't have to hit the network. So that's the index. It doesn't expose it, but it's there. Git actually exposes it and makes you deal with it in a lot of ways. You don't, you can get it work around not using it, but it does expose it. It actually becomes a powerful tool if you want to use it. Um, so for deb commit, what you have to do is actually tell, you have to manually update the index for the Debian change log, and only then will deb commit see the change, which is really horrendous and really the wrong way to do it. So there's a couple problems with deb commit in terms of Debian right now, and I'd, I'd love to see those get fixed, but I, I think that um, it's probably not the correct way to be doing things right now. I think the tools are substandard for, for the, the specific needs of Git. They were really written with subversion in mind, or CVS. Any other questions, comments? Martin. Do you use any uh, feature branches? Um, Do I use what? Feature branches. With that, I mean. Yes. Is, yes. Okay. Would so, you Would you care to explain that workflow? Uh, a feature sure. branch is like, uh, if if you decide to add another feature that may want to go upstream at one point in time, then uh, you put that all in the branch, and then later on you can merge that branch back into your tree or send it upstream. Upstream. Right. So, yeah, 
Martin brings up really one of the key points of using distributed version control, and especially Git, actually, because Git's branching model is cheaper than anything you've ever seen. Um, so version, they say branches are cheap, but it's only cheap if you're using SVK, because you have to hit the network every time you want to switch a branch. SVN switch, it takes forever, right? So how many people use SVN switch or have used it? It takes a while, right? I mean, especially for a large tree, you have to like wait for the network. So I have a new branch. You know, I mean, it was nothing. Like, it, it just happened. Um, there was no hitting the network. There was no nothing. It just, it just works. So, um, get what this allows you to do, and it really kind of encourages is these what Martin was talking about these feature branches, where anytime you want to make a change that's substantial, and honestly, even when it's not that substantial, if it's a one-line fix that you really want to test extensively, or you know, whatever. Um, it's really useful to have these. And then what you do is you just make it there, you commit it in that feature branch that no one ever sees except for you, and then you pull it back into your, um, into your main thing to push it to, um, to upstream. And they're really great because they're extremely cheap, and you can just delete them later. No one ever knows they existed but you. And um, it's really powerful because you can have a billion feature branches around at any given time. Um, so. I think that it, it encourages a very a, a better model. It's really the right way to development is to have feature branches. Um, I think that Subversion, uh, hopefully Subversion will get proper merging. They say they will. Um, but it's really a nightmare. Every time we had to update the, um, every time I had to merge in updates for, uh, for, X, for example, in the Xorg 6.8 to 6.9 transition, I had to merge a lot of updates by hand, and it was just horrendous. So you don't have to do that as much with Git. It just kind of works. One question on the feature branches, where at least I'm a bit struggling currently, is if I have uh, some version of my Debian package and says, well, okay, or basically I say I want to have the upstream as a, as a main target and make all features I add as feature branches, which seems sensible to me. So, so then, I, then I get the next version of upstream, um, commit, the, uh, commit the changes in, or import the changes in my main thing. And now, what I do, I do to the feature branches, and what I do to the resulting Debian package to have it all without uh, major pain. Because then I'm somehow struggling. Probably I just need to probably yes, bring a brain to accept it, how it works, but. Okay. Um, so, you want, uh, you'll have to let me try and repeat this and see if I got it right. Um, you want to have multiple feature branches, and you want to merge it back without pain. Is that right? Okay, it works. Even worse, I want to have, basically I said, okay, I have the upstream package, I have the Debian package. Yes. And all the features that I add in the Debian mm -hmm. package, I want to have as separate so that I can see, okay, this feature now has this and this and that. So in case upstream decides to, uh, upstream, I so I can send them separate to upstream, and I want to keep them as feature branches until upstream decided to, to merge them. So how do I do that, especially if there are new upstream versions in between? So you do that as pull only, essentially. No? Rebates. This is a new one. This is why I wanted the boff, so people could teach me things. Yeah, I, I have what heard, are rebates? <laughs> I have heard about rebates, but I've never really done it successfully. All right, Keith can explain rebates, because I don't know this one. This is you exciting. Rebase. Yeah, re Get, oh, rebase. Rebase. What rebase. Git rebase Go does is it, um, so say you have a feature branch that has one commit on it for the right. ease of discussion here. Um, what git rebase does is it does a diff from that feature branch back to, the, back to where it was branched from, uh, generates a patch, and then applies that patch where, wherever you want to rebase to, and then moves the branch to the result of that uh, commit. So it takes a diff, does a patch, does a commit, and moves the branch to that new point. So it basically relinks your feature branch to a new place in the tree. And so see what it does? There's a good picture there. You can see it merging. It's moving. You have right. on your topic branch, you have three commits, A, B, and C, and they're originally based at E. What the rebase does is it actually moves them so that they, they are now based on top of the commit at G, and all of your, all of your changes are, are integrated appropriately. And the commit it's using the regular, the regular Git merging techniques, uh, which uh, are pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, I use this a lot. 
uh, because as I do a feature branch, the last thing I want to do is expose that feature branch and the, and the fact that I used a feature branch in publishing my changes. So I'll do a bunch of commits along a feature branch, I'll rebase to master, and then I'll push the results. So I get a single line of development. I don't get these artificial branches. And that makes, the, uh, that makes the resulting tree look a lot cleaner when you push it back as well. But you can do this with as many branches as you want. So you could, you could automate pulling in a new master branch and just rebase all of your topic branches quite easily. So, and how do I do it if I say I have all my feature branches concentrated in one, in my Debian version, so all features are imported there? I, it's just, it's just as, well, the, all, my Debian version should just uh, come from all these, these, uh, these uh, branches, so how do I do that? Or just, is my branch just wrapped up enough around it yet? I, I think you'd have to play with it. Okay. On. And then. So uh, having, having rebased, uh, it's common enough for me to want to do, go and do archaeology on previous versions of my package to see what it did in some circumstance. Uh, it, looks, it looks to me like uh, once you rebased, you're, that's it, your topic branch is now the new thing. Uh, can you go back and look at what it used to be? I don't believe so. Oh, you can go back. I've never tried this. Just, just go on Ke yeah, Keith should stand up here. <laughs> this is great. Now, the important thing here is to look at the old commits. The old commits were labeled A, B, and C. The new commits are labeled A prime, B prime, and C prime. The old uh -huh. commits are still in the repository. If you have a version, if you have a distribution version that points to those old commits, they're still valid. So you can still do diffs against. So you may have rebased the topic branch. But if you have some other branch name pointing to that place, like a released version, uh, that old branch will still, re, uh, re, uh, still refer to those old commits. So you lose nothing. Git never throws anything away. Right. right. So in the back, he's, he says Anna Proa. So I'm a subversion user trying to figure out you know, what, what this is all about, because I keep hearing lots of people saying this is just the best thing since sliced bread, and I, 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 haven't, figured, I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, so I've got a bunch of Debian packages. I maintain them in subversion. I use Quilt for all changes to anything upstream. Um, so I basically have no modifications outside of the Debian directory. How does Git help me? Because you, you say that one of the big things about Git is you can merge with new upstream versions real easily. Right. But well, I have a bunch of Quilt packages. I have to merge, merge the Quilt patches. Does Git help with that? So um, Quilt is an amazing tool. I, I don't think I can sell it quite enough. So you might not be getting tons of benefits out of Subversion, if, or, I'm sorry, out of Git, if you have Quilt inside of Subversion. I mean, we were doing that, and it was very successful. But even without that, I found that Git, I mean, number one, you, you save a lot of time with Git. It's fast. You, you, you do save a lot of time just doing basic operations. And um, so you, you, there is a net gain there. And most importantly is really the branching. You can have very easy branches, and you can commit anywhere. You can commit on the airplane. You can commit when, you don't have, when your wireless is down. You can commit anywhere without any troubles. Anything is equal. Um, and that's really a very nice tool to have available to you. Um, the branching truly is cheap. It's not like this sort of fake, I have to hit the network every time to get it cheap, um, which opens up new models of development that's almost hard to describe in a way. Um, I got to say real quick that I think a lot of your speed problems with subversion were because you had a painfully slow subversion server, not because subversion is actually slow. I mean, I, you're, the situation you're describing with slowness in subversion, I've just never experienced that. We have a very, I mean, we were maintaining the XORG monolith inside of subversion. It's a very large package set. Subversion did not scale very well to that. Um, it, it's, it's hard. Martin has, oh, and Pierre as well. Uh, yeah, Pierre was first. Uh, actually, first, I'd like to stress that Git is fast. And it's a thing that you cannot stress enough, even if you have uh, I've used SVN uh, with, uh, EC over ECSH, with uh, ECSH control masters, which helps a lot. And Git is awfully faster. And well, once you have tried Git once, you just can't use anything else because it's really, really fast. And you can't bear the fact that it takes ages to, to commit a thing in SVN anymore. 
And on the other hand, I'd like to come back to Rebase a bit because David said that uh, Git is only use, well, not only, but is useful, especially if your upstream is, uh, uses Git. In fact, that's not true because there is a lot and a lot of um, tools to make Git interact with, with uh, other uh, SCMs like SVN, but CVS also, and uh, Arch or Bezador also. It works really well. And with Rebase, uh, you can have all the nice features of Git working, even if your upstream uh, is dumb enough to use, his, to use CVS or SVN. In fact, well, I will, I'm not there quite yet, but I'm trying to package a lot of things uh, using these techniques and uh, having my patches in Git and uh, sending them upstream and seeing them come back through their CV, uh, CVS or SVN server and seeing them merged uh, using Rebase. I'm not sure this workflow works very well yet, but I'm quite sure that Git will perform very well because well, it has been written to work like that. And in fact, using it that way is introducing the distributing way, distributed way because your own, and it's really what uh, David is, uh, and uh, Julien and the uh, X uh, task force are doing. In fact, he said we have a central repository. That's not true. They have a satellite, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, their, their main repository is a free desktop one. You have uh, a, fork, um, a secondary repository, and your repository is already in a distributed model, and you are using it, in fact. Even if in the, ta the X -tax task force you are using this repository as a reference, in fact, it's a, only a second one. So, I think Git is a great tool because it's fast, you can work at home, you can then push things later, you can work in the plane back from the conf and it will work. And you can, and, well, you have to try it, in fact. In fact, there is nothing to, to persuade, to, yeah, to convince you more easily than using it. Just play around. Uh, for the record, uh, I've, uh, there is an import on the web uh, of uh, the full GLIBC history from 1983. It's 150 megabytes big. And you have everything. And when I work with uh, Aurelien on the, on the LIBC, today he asked me three or four times, well, when did that patch or test came up in the repository? Because with Git, I have the answer under one second. When he has to go through the view CVS thing, well, maybe in, a, in one hour or two, he will have the answer. I want to get back to that question why uh, Git is so much better than SVN and Quill for uh, package maintenance and well if if all you do is ever pack maintain your own package in SVN with killed on top to manage patches that were submitted by the bug tracking system then i have to admit that um the speed which these two guys have been really high up on um is is one of the main reasons but as soon as you start to do things like branching as soon as you actually develop a parts of the package and you use a branch to do that you really do not want to be using SVN. Um, I'm a Zoop and Plone developer, and Zoop and Plone use SVN, and it's a rather big repository as well. And one of the things that Git does very differently from SVN is merging branches. Because the way, and um, I hope nobody minds if I just explain this a little, um, the way that things work in SVN is that basically branches are nothing other than two separate file trees, so that if you merge them, what you're doing is applying a patch. Now imagine that you are creating um, one branch to do feature A, another branch to do feature B, and another branch for feature C, and now you fi figure out that you actually need feature A to get feature C working. So you merge branch A into branch C, 
and then you continue working on C and you continue working on B and at one point in time you decide that B and C are both ripe for production so you merge them back into the trunk when there is a conflict because all the changes that are in B are or in A are already also in C and what you'll end up with is a hundred reject files and org files and you have to tell SVN that now this conflict is resolved and now this conflict is resolved and the way that Git does it is that every single commit has an, a unique string, a unique identity attached to it. So if you merge two branches, what's happening is simply the union of the sets or the, a set addition and it only pulls in exactly those commits that aren't already in your local branch. So it is actually very much smarter about it. Yeah. So if you use branches, don't do it in subversion. Right. And there's there's other I mean there's fairly common examples of needing branches that are they're just trivial but you can't do them in subversion trivially and that's really a problem like if if you've got if you've got a, if you've got something that you're not finished with um, you know a commit uh, you know some sort of commit you're not finished with it's a long term commit or a long term branch that you really just want to work on and it's not done. Um, Git, you can just do a local clone very quickly and very easily. With, with I mean, you can copy it in Subversion, but it, it gets, it's, it, Subversion's also really huge. The, the data directories are much, much bigger than in Git. Git compresses amazingly well, and you can make it compress even better um, using all sorts, of, all sorts of tools that it exposes that you don't have to use, but it's available to you if you want them. Um, repack and all these things. So there's some very nice things that it provides that are very low level that I don't understand yet, so I won't go over them. Um, but they're available to you if you want to learn them. Uh, how is the format, what is it, the format the Git stores in the repositories? Because let's say I want to set up some tiny repository to play with Git, manage my documents, whatever, but I want to do backups from it. And then if it's all compressed as one file, for example, I would need to backup it each time with each tiny modification, or is it friendly to that? Oh, it's available to you. I mean, it, it compresses internally. Um, I don't remember the, the format it uses internally. It, it, it doesn't throw anything away, though. Um, but it's all available to you. I mean, in a, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. It's not like a tarball and tarball. It's more like one file per commit. It's one file per commit, so I can... Is it internally? Yeah, so how friendly it is. is it to R-Sync backups? That's basically the question. How friendly is it to what? R-Sync backups, basically. I, I didn't understand, I'm sorry. My <laughs> oh, R-Sync, oh, it's trivial. Yeah, I've already synced several Git repositories. You can do it. You can clone. Um, cloning is, I don't know if it is an rsync, but it might as well be in a lot of ways. You can rsync a, a, a directory, no problem. And then you can check out. If it's just a bare Git directory, you can check it out from there as well. Okay. So Pierre is saying that clone is a better way to synchronize a repository. I've done it. It's not been a huge problem, but it, you know. Um, you know, you can rsync. You, can, you certainly can. If it's hosted, you can pull it. I don't think you can. Uh, well, no, it doesn't throw anything away. So I honestly don't know the answer to that. Oh, and then you have to transfer the entire thing. Right, right. Okay, now I understand. I see. So yeah, I don't know internally um, if that's if that's the case. I, I think if you probably don't pack it too much, it's probably not a huge deal. Um, you can pack it at some point, and it will compress into a very. It might be one file. I don't know. It's it's highly compressed at that point. Um, but I've never looked into it that deeply to know the answer to that. I'm sorry. So so while we're on the question of rsync, I've um, used buzzer a bit and I found that rsyncing buzzo repositories is a complete pain because they contain enormous numbers of files. Uh, does Git suffer from this problem? A key the answer, I guess. It doesn't need to. Uh, by default, um, every, com every file, every version of every file in Git is its own file. 
So in the old, in the original repository structure, yes, there were a phenomenal number of files. Every time you made a change to a single file, there would be a new file created in your repository, which if you tried to rsync that, it would be a disaster. Um, um, however, uh, once Linus figured out that that was probably not very scalable, um, <laughs> he came up with a, a technique for taking multiple files independent of where the, where, where the original source, independent of, of what source file they came from, you look at multiple files in the repository and pack them all together, aligning their common data, uh, data chunks um, such that, the, uh, that you can pull out files very rapidly from the pack, uh, packed version of the archive. Um, and then, so, so what you do is you run the uh, git repack command, which takes all of the unpacked files and sticks them in a single new pack file. So you basically have all of the things that you've done recently in your repository are now in a single file. Now if you rsync that, you copy one file. Now you work for a week or two, you make a bunch of new changes, you have a bunch of individual files, you pack those together into another pack file, and you rsync again, and it copies one file. So it's extremely efficient with rsync because you copy only the changes that you've made since you rsync last time, and, you own, and the entire rsync operation is a single file. Now, if you want to, you can actually take all of, if you have a thousand pack files now, you can actually tell Git to repack all of those into a single larger file, and it will throw away all the indiv individual pack files. And at that point, you rsync, you are syncing the whole new file. But you can shrink your repository dramatically by that. Um, uh, the entire uh, six years of X repository information for the X server is like, you know, 50, 50 megabytes or something, which is <laughs> about the same size as a single checkout. Right, that's something to bring up actually. When we had our subversion, so a single subversion checkout of the X server from our old sub subversion repository was about twice as large as the checkout from the X server upstream when, we switch, when X.org switched to Git, and we had the entire history in every single branch ever, whereas it was just one checkout of one branch from subversion of our, of our own X strike force repository. Um, I've, I know subversion's gotten better in that regard, but in reality there's massive space savings for Git. Um, just very quickly, I just did an rsync test on a Git repository and uh, therefore I haven't listened to everything that Keith said, so I hope I'm not repeating something. But uh, basically a commit will result in additional files being created, okay. but no existing files modified. So it's friendly for backups. Right. Um, and with the addition of that repacking, um, I'm sure you can get even like archive history and then yeah. make it even better for that. In fact, actually, uh, you can sync uh, a Git repository, but it's quite a bad idea because a clone will get everything from your repository. And in fact, the better way to, to back up a Git repository is to clone it. And if you have a, a back, and it, it's exactly what I do with my Git repositories. I have a script that clone it on some backup servers I have. And when I commit to my central repository, my backups pull again, and they pull only the changes because Git uh, transports is efficient and does what I think will do in a better way. Uh, Andy has a question as well, and then Ian. Sorry, um, just quickly, um, I don't think that rsync is the best way to duplicate a Git repository because you will n it, it's not an atomic um, transaction, which is what you're saying. But uh, sometimes if you have a backup tool that runs and it is based on rsync. You can't really do anything else unless you want to switch over to something called Backup Ninja, which is an awesome pro um, program that uh, you can actually tell it to first clone the directory and then rsync that because there will be no commits going on. Uh, and Colin, I totally, I'm sorry. <laughs> you to... Actually, one thing that I, everyone done? It's meant to be broken by children. Okay, so one question, what, what I repeatedly do with other systems, what for example Subversion can do, is that I can just check out a subdirectory. Right. Can I do that with is Git, and if so, how? No, okay, so that's the problem with Git. You cannot currently do that. And we've actually had to sort of balkanize some of the X stuff a little bit to make that happen. There's two things that Git doesn't do that I would like. One is check out individual directories. So you wouldn't want to say, 
put have one Git repository for like all of the package GNOME stuff, you know, and then you can't do that. You would have to have one for each, you know, Metacity and one for Nautilus and one for, you know, all these things. So Git can't do that currently. There's work underway though to make something similar to that happen, which is called subprojects, which is what you would really want it for anyway. And the idea would be to have, you know, Nautilus be a subproject of the GNOME repository. And as far as I know, what what I've been told by um, XCB maintainers is that uh, some of that, a lot of that underlying work is in place. It's not hooked into the UI and it's not hooked into the merge support yet. So it's not fully there. Um, and then the other thing that Git cannot do that Subversion can do that's often demanded is uh, the equivalent to SVN colon externals. Um, does anyone know what this is or use externals? Okay, so there's a few people. So it's, it's, it's you'd use it for some project sort of thing. It's basically, you, you're able to pull in um, um, a specific directory or, or repository into a specific part of your own Subversion repository and use that externally. And it, it's, it's pretty seamless. It works really well. We used it for um, shared packaging information among the X packages. And the way we do it now is we just have a separate repository for that shared packaging information and manually pull it in rather than let the revision control system deal with it. So that's something Git doesn't do really well yet that Subversion does do. Um, Colin? Uh, you, you have the same problem in other uh, distributed revision control systems. I mean, Arch and BZR both have the same constraints. And uh, you can almost certainly just use the same, if you're, if you're desperate, you can almost certainly just use the same tools. Uh, the, the Arch guys wrote something called Config Manager, which is a bit of a hack, but it's just something that takes a, a, a plain text file description of the other projects that you want to incorporate basically like SVN externals and uh, check those out and or update them as necessary. Uh, and you can probably just use the same thing. Interesting. Yeah, the problem I've heard with that, and I, I don't know enough about the implementation of revision control to, to, to comment on this further, but the idea is that each change is actually a change set and that it, it covers, it's, it's, a, it's basically a change set over, across the entire repository. So if you want to pull out a specific change set, you have to get the entire repository. You can't just pull out a subdirectory, and this seems to be an architectural issue, which is the way these things are implemented. Um, that's, that's what I've heard. I don't know if anyone can comment further on that. Uh, I see we have 15 minutes. Yes. Oh. And then Sam. Uh, small question, back to Debian tools. Uh, I have a um, requirement to pack Eric Targazé uh, from tag, not from uh, branch head, but from tag sources. Is there any Debian tool which can provide it? From, from what sources? Uh, tag sources. So, uh, well, my um, Eric Targazé is not in head, uh, somewhere maybe in previous tag sources. Mm, well, uh, I have an upstream branch, yeah, okay. and uh, there is upstream version 1.0, 1.2, okay. 1.3, oh. and so on. I have tech for all of them, and uh, the head now is 1.3, for example. I want a rig target for 1.1. I want to build a Debian package 1.1 sure. minus something. Yeah, so we do that. So the, there's a limitation. In, so yes, you can tag anything you want. We do tag our own. We tag our packages. To build a rig target from it. To build what? Uh, well, um, you not. not Yeah, and actually git build package will build your own orig.tar.gz and that's actually one of the problems I have with it. It actually will build that for you out of, the, out of the git repository. It can be done. I don't think it's the right way to do things. I think it should just, you know, use what's there. Um, git build package? Yes. It uses head. Oh, it uses head. Yeah. Okay. I just checked. Okay. Is there any way to fine tune access control? Is there what? Um, how do I manage passwords or access to, to the main repository? It's via SSH. 
So we use SSH and things like that. So for local stuff, I mean, I, I've never tried to do local access um, restrictions. Um, but for remote stuff, it's just it, it's just SSH. Which means you cannot restrict someone to a specific branch or something? Not that I know of. Does anyone know if it's possible? Really? How do you configure that? <laughs> Actually, there is some ways uh, to, to enforce that, but I don't think uh, there, is, there will ever be a very powerful tool to do that because Linus explains that uh, basically he doesn't, he doesn't want to hide code and uh, he just wants people to clone the, the main repository, do whatever stupid things they want in the repository, but he won't give them access, right access to him repository. He, won't just pull, he will just pull from them. So in fact, the, any access control is done because he either he pulls from people he trusts or he reviews the patch because he, before he mails them. Also, uh, we want to use a distributed rep, um, version control system at work, and the major showstopper for us is that we have a lot of Windows people. Are there any GUIs that, that are in the works? I don't think there's any GUIs yet. I mean, there's, there's, I don't even know if they run because they're TK based. I assume they'll run on Windows. Um, there's, there's the git commit tool, which comes with git 1.5, and there's also uh, git k, which is really a wonderful. So has anyone seen, people might not have seen git. Let's see if you can see it in 800 by 600 <coughs> on my slow laptop. Um, so there are visualization tools, but they're not great. They're nothing like Tortoise SVN or anything like that that are really quite nice. Um, but there are really nice visualization tools for the likes of, of us. So if you want to see, you know, changes, um, I believe Bizzer has cloned this, right? Bizzer has something similar to this right now? What? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this has been cloned because it's a really good idea and it's really nice. I don't think Subversion has anything like this. Um, it's just a really nice interface to, to check out changes and see how, see how branches merge. And this is a relatively simple branching pattern, so you don't see a whole lot, but it can get complicated. Are you serious? Sorry. It's here. You, you talked Sorry. about the branches and they were shown on, on the screen. Sorry. I, I, I didn't get Keith to fix my laptop like he managed to fix Martin's. So, <laughs> um, I, sorry about that. But yeah, basically it's a really nice visualization tool. But um, the problem is also just getting Git running at all on Windows. There's a MinGW port in progress. I don't think it's mature. I haven't been following it closely. And then there's, you can run it through Sigwin, but a lot of people don't like using Sigwin. So it seems like if you're going to use distributed revision control on Windows, the real winner seems to be Mercurial from general consensus that I've read around. And Mercurial is a great system. I will not badmouth it at all because it's wonderful. And it's very similar to Git in a lot of ways. But hopefully Git will eventually come to Windows properly and people, we can, you know, not have this issue of at work people want to use it. Yeah, Bizzard does too. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. So yeah, several. There, there are other options, and Darks does too. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I like Haskell. <laughs> so is that five? Ten. Ten. Great. I have one addition. There is a nice talk from Linus Torvalds himself on Google videos. Yes. So if you have seven, 70 minutes, I guess, time, it's uh, funny <laughs> and interesting. Yeah. Is it, who's, who's watched Linus's talk at Google on Google video? It was very well seen. It's, it's good. He, he really smashes the subversion people. Kind of, he's kind of mean about it. Um, <laughs> awesome. I bet he, I bet he loved it. Um, but I think Linus is really spot on in a lot of ways in that video, and it really is good to see what he's thinking about and why he made the choices he made um, with certain things. And it really does clarify a lot of the design things, uh, design choices that Git has made in terms of that seemed like they might be bad choices at the beginning, and they really have, have turned out to really for the better. Um, I know you said. Uh, you wouldn't go over how you went from Subversion to Git, but if you've got a little time, can you maybe go over that process a little? Because uh, to do to do what exactly? Going from Subversion to Git, migrating. I can't go over that. Uh, I you mean, can't I, go over that? I can tell you what we did, but there's better ways to do that now. So there was a script that comes with. Um, I know a peer is going to. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know what he's going to say because he blogged about it, and it's actually very exciting. Uh, so we used there was a script that came with it to convert the repository. It's this massive Perl script, and it would go through the subversion repository and sort of guess what was the right thing to do at every time, and it would convert it to a Git-like format. And we had to hack theory had to hack that up insanely to get it to work for our messed up subversion repository. Uh, but he managed to do it. Uh, so that's how we did it. But, in for, and then, but the better way to do it is that there's actually a program called Git-SVN, which comes with it, and it'll, that's what. Pierre is raving about. And I haven't had the opportunity to use it yet, so I can't really talk about it very much. But basically, it allows you to transparently use Git with a subversion uh, repository so that your coworkers don't know you're using Git, they don't have to care, and you get all the benefits of using it, essentially, with uh, subversion being the back end. Um, so you can actually, by making a clone using Git SVN, you get a Git repository that's totally converted, and it just works. And then, so that's probably the best way to do it these days. And you just get the repository for free and you don't have to deal with all the mess that we did. Um, so not having the experience with that myself, I can't really lead you through it. Um, but that seems to be the right way to do it. Pierre, do you want to add to that? He's actually got experience with it. Actually, I'm using Git uh, SVN for two things at work because uh, we sadly use SVN at work. And for to work on the GLIBC because the GLIBC uses uh, svn.debian.org, but uh, I use it through Git. But uh, in fact, Git SVN is a very good tool to migrate a repository because it does everything by itself. But it's not a good idea to to believe you can learn Git using Git SVN because you have most of the benefit of benefits of Git, but you have you still have SVN behind and. Uh, when you have things like that here, well, what you see is a merge. It's basically that the, the graph that is behind has a, a, a convergence, a, a convergence, a merge point, and you can't have that in SVN. So, in fact, in SVN, you are you are forced to have a linear a linear linear uh, history and to use git svn you have you have to know how to linear linearize your history and it's quite hard to to figure it out uh, when you're new to to git so if you want to switch it's better to sometimes run git svn to have a full git repository that is the, the same as your old svn one and use git on this repository and if you don't like it, go back to SVN for a while and retry it every time you want. Because using it SVN, you have to know Git a bit before. Mark? Okay, I, I just quickly wanted to say I claimed a little while ago that uh, you could control users user access writing, I can't find the information anymore. So I think it's better to assume that you can't do it and get a positive surprise. Uh, you know, I'll let you know if I find it still. And uh, just quickly tagging onto this, uh, the, the talk today is about Git and Debian, right? right. I just wanted to uh, do a little bit of a self-publication here because right. uh, on the 21st, which is uh, Thursday, Manoj and I are going to give a workshop at 2 o'clock. Uh, for two hours, which is about using distributed version control for Debian packaging. And we hope to be able, it's the same model for Git or Bizer or any of these other ones, we hope to be able to give some ideas of what are the things you can do with branches to make your day easier. So uh, on Thursday at 2. Uh, Pierre, you mentioned uh, problems with using Git and SVN due to merge points, which I assume is from Subversion not doing merge tracking itself. Uh, has anybody looked at integrating Git with SVK or with the uh, with the extra merge point tracking that's basically what SVK, SVK gives you over Subversion? Uh, has anybody looked at integrating Git with SVK, which... Uh, basically stacks properties on top of Subversion. I know it's horrible, but yeah. if you want to interwork, then uh, it's one decent way to do it. Uh, 
actually, I don't think uh, it has been uh, even considered because uh, there is no no point in using in well using SVK when you can use Git Git SVN. Yeah, yeah, sure, but Git already already gives you that. In fact, so you you have many ways to work with uh, with uh, SVN in backend, and having many merges in Git, you can, uh, for example, uh, create a squash commit, uh, which is what Git uh, SVN does anyways. So okay, in a Git kind of way, it's horrible, but when you work in with SVN, you don't have a choice. So you have many ways to hide the facts that there were merges and. In fact, uh, the author uh, of Git SVN uh, uses it, and I do that all the time also, as a two-way gateway to a SVN repository, and you don't really want to bother with SVK. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree with you, but on the other, on the, on the other hand, um, uh, the other users of the, the SVN repository won't benefit of it if they don't use this SVK as well. And in fact, they could also use Git. <laughs> okay, well, we're down to less than five minutes left, so if there's no further questions, we may as well, as he's holding up, I'm time out anyway. So we're done. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I really am overwhelmed by the response. And I hope you've learned something that you'll enjoy.